Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And don't forget to hit that notification bell so that you never miss an upload. Welcome back to Chats and Recaps, another haunted episode. Ooh. Really? <laughs> Gotta start it with the yeah. ooh. And today we're talking about the incredibly twisted murder hotel of H.H. H. Holmes. Mm, Not sicko. to be confused with Sherlock Holmes. No. Or H.H. H. Mm. Gregg. I know, right? H.H. <laughs> H. Greg. Every time you say H.H., H., yeah. I keep thinking you're going to end it with Greg. Nope. H.H. H. Holmes. All right. So the H.H. H. Holmes Murder Hotel has 100 rooms that were filled with trap doors, gas chambers, staircases to nowhere, and a human-sized stove. Human-sized Until you get to human-sized stove. stove, it makes you wonder for a second, are we talking about the Winchester house, which also ha- was a maze of things and had know, right? stairways that led to nowhere? No, I know. but perhaps they were haunted by the same ghost they were that stairs. made them create these crazy homes. Well, the thing was, the stairs <laughs> that led get to it? nowhere homes, were homes. actually hidden hidden uh, trap doors and stuff. Uh. So his stuff led homes, to somewhere. I know, homes, right? homes, <laughs> homes, 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 homes. <laughs> that could be a good name for like a company. Homes, homes. So the hotel's name is uh, the World's Fair Hotel, commonly known as the H.H. H. Holmes House or Murder Mansion. You might run up a flight of stairs and find that it led to nowhere. You'd open doors and see only solid brick. You'd enter a bedroom your hidden pipes quietly come alive and smell the gas seeping in you try to run and realize you were locked in and even if the door opened you probably couldn't find your way out only H. H. holmes himself ever knew all of the castle secrets including how many people died within its walls wow that's crazy imagine just go into a room and then all of a sudden gas in and then you're like oh my gosh i'm about to die i know that's crazy so before we get to know about the house we're going to talk a little bit about H.H. H. Holmes. He arrived in Chicago. Oh, P.S. H.H. H. in the H.H. H. Holmes. His name is Henry Herman. I'm Webs- Herman. <laughs> I don't know his name is Herman Webster Mudgett. And H.H. H. Holmes was his al- Ali- Elias. How his do you say that? Name. Alias? His alias. Elias? Alias? Oh, there you go. <laughs> I cannot <laughs> say that word. So his actual name was Herman Webster Mudgett. Yeah. And he went by H.H. H. Holmes as an alias. Correct. There you go. Um, that sounds more right. Yeah. Alias. He changed his name. Um, he came to, he went to Chicago in 1886, leaving behind more than one previous life. So he, there was a reason why he changed his yeah. name. He was born Herman Webster Mudgett, like you said. Changing um, your name and using an alias. Just serial killer things. Yeah. And because of scandals, previous scandals in the past, it gave him that reason to change his name. Like in college, when he worked in the anatomy lab and mutilated cadavers to defraud life insurance companies. Or when he was the last person to have been seen with a missing little boy in New York. Or when he worked as a pharmacist in Philadelphia and a young customer died after taking pills that he had provided. The moral of the story is that this man had a long history Mm -hmm. of doing things, including like all different types of fraud, scams. Uh, Apparently, it's not his first time with like the murder thing. So yeah. He has a history. This is why he probably had multiple aliases. And then this Mm -hmm. is the final alias that led to the murder mansion or murder hotel. Yeah. So Mudgett skipped town after all these incidents and eventually became Henry Howard Holmes, who soon after his arrival in the Windy City, got a job in a drugstore on 63rd Street, using his knowledge of medicine and his ability to charm everyone he met to secure his position. Holmes was fashionable bright and likable like most of them are in fact he was so charming that at one point in his life he was married to three unknowing women at once 
Wow. So he was a big So he was too. also a player. Mm-hmm. In 1887, he bought the empty lot across the street from the store where he worked and began construction on a three-story building, which he said would be used for apartments and shops aka more scams probably uh -huh. or creepy things or murder the structure was ugly and large containing more than 100 rooms and stretching for an entire block chicago was a city on the rise in the late 1880s and new construction was going up all over this stretch of the american west the city was perfectly situated on the shore of Lake Michigan, and it was the central hub for the expansive railroad networks that crisscrossed the nation, all extending like spokes in a wheel from the city of Chicago. Ooh, that's a lot of rooms. Wait a minute. So this apartment building that he's building, is the apartment building actually the murder mansion? Yes, it is. That would explain why it had 100 rooms. Yes. For his mansion, H.H. H. Holmes planned for the first floor to contain an entire block of storefronts he would be able to rent out to the flood of new businesses opening up in the city. The third floor would contain apartments for the growing population of the city, looking to make it big in the Windy City, some of whom would become Holmes' victims. Those victims got to see the second floor in the especially unlucky ones made it into the basement, which hid the elaborate horrors for which the H.H. H. Holmes house is now famous. Holmes switched builders and architects frequently throughout the building's construction, so no one involved was able to realize the gruesome end goal of all the odd parts. The castle was completed in 1892, and by 1894, police would be exploring its winding passages while Holmes sat behind bars. At first, they were confused at what they found. I know, it was like all these oh tunnels gosh. and doors. Oh. P.S. There's some good, we're getting this off of allthatsinteresting.com. They have a lot of like cool stories and stuff on mm -hmm. there. And I'm going to link it like I did in the last episode. I linked yes. the site so you can go there. Because and you can see the pictures, yeah, the illustrations and the architects. Yes. Yeah, that you have to see that really shows you how crazy the design yes. of this house was. Yeah. There were hinged walls and false partitions. Some rooms had five doors and others had none. Secret airless chambers hid underneath floor floorboards, sorry, and iron plate lined walls stifled all sound. Holmes' own apartment had a trapdoor in the bathroom, which opened to reveal a staircase, which led to a windowless cubicle. In the cubicle, there was a large chute that tunneled through to the basement. Spoiler. It wasn't used for dirty laundry. Wait, you think it was used to like drop bodies down? Yeah, <laughs> that's what it was used for. One notable room was lined with gas fixtures. Here, Holmes would seal his victims in, flip a switch in an, adju in an adjacent room. Adjacent. <laughs> I can't speak today. Flip a switch in an adjacent room and wait. Another shoot was nearby. All of the doors and some of the steps were connected to an intricate alarm system. Whenever someone stepped into the hall or headed downstairs, a buzzer sounded in Holmes' bedroom. Wow. <laughs> My only thing is I'm wondering, what is he getting out of this? He's getting murder victims that he's going to murder. Literally just he to tortures just them. murder people, that's it? That's, he, just, that's, he did that's it to no torture goal. them. Uncovering Chicago's House of Horrors, the first clue about the bizarre floor plans, true purpose, came to the cops in a pile of bones. Most of them were animals, but some of them were human. So small, they had to have belonged to a child, no more than six or seven years old. Now wow. I'm starting to think, there were a lot of children. I'm wondering if he was a pedophile. Perhaps. Yeah, remember earlier in one of his previous yeah, little boy was, aliases, yes. there was, uh, had something to do with a missing little boy. Mm -hmm. When they descended into the cellar, the scope of the building's hidden horrors were re was revealed. Beside a blood-covered operating table, they found a woman's blood-soaked clothes. Another surgical surface was nearby, along with a crematory. An array of medical tools, a bizarre torture device, and shelves of disintegrating acids. 
Oh my God, what he put those people through. How disturbing. It's like when you watch those horror movies and they're like performing surgeries on people that are still alive. And I'm just like, Ugh, I hate this. Holmes' fascination with dead bodies had lasted long past college as had his surgical skills. After dropping his victims down through the chutes, he would dissect them, clean them, and sell the organs or skeletons to medical uh -huh. institutions or on the black market. Now we have the motive now, behind a lot of this. One, he's getting the satisfaction of doing it because he's a freaking psycho creep who enjoys maiming dead bodies. But nope. second, he's making an income off of this because he's removing the viable organs and selling them on the black market. Now I have a better, you know, like motive behind him doing this because otherwise before it made no sense. Yep. Though the mansion didn't look inviting in the least, it's unlikely that any of the victims were dragged into his depths. They entered on their own volition likely enchanted by the owner's flattery and apparent affluence. Often, they were his employees. During his two short years in the castle, Holmes hired more than 150 women to work as his stenographers. A few of those were known to be his mistresses as well. Most of them came from wealthy families and some of them never saw those families again. Holmes sometimes photographed his favorites, they were young, beautiful, and trusting of this gentleman in the big and unfamiliar city. You know, like you said, we always come across these things in these stories. They just know who to of course they pick, know. you know. They, they do. Know, they they scout out people who are uh, like, weak. I don't know, kind of have like an innocence mm -hmm. or weak-minded or easily trusting. Yeah. Yep. It's always someone who's missing something in their life that they when you call me paranoid, you call fulfill. me yeah. When you call me paranoid, you call me mm -hmm. safe. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's me, Miss Paranoid. I'm always questioning why are you talking to me like that? What is your motive? What is behind all of this? <laughs> you know the thing. Like if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. It is. Mm -hmm. As a city on the rise and centrally located nationally, thanks to its railway hub. There was a fresh flow of people coming in and out of Holmes' murder mansion. Despite the well-connected woman who went missing under his employment, suspicions of murder weren't what eventually led to Holmes' demise. People come and go all the time in a big city, often without notice. So the disappearance of the young women working under Holmes could always be excused as young women moving on or heading back home. Wow. That's true. I mean, no internet or anything like that. So there was, if somebody was missing somebody, it was really no way to. I know. They'd be like, hmm, they oh, haven't they sent a letter left. to me in two yes. months. <laughs> it's like, maybe we should check on them. By then they're dead. <laughs> or they don't even know that they're not there anymore. They're like, hmm, I know, haven't received a letter. Send out a letter. Hmm, they haven't returned my letters in an exceedingly long time. I, know. I wonder what's going on. Rather, yeah, because this was what eighteen in the eighteen hundreds, yeah, the, the late eighteen hundreds, yeah, late eighteen hundreds, like eighteen ninety. Mm -hmm. It was in the eighteen nineties, the beginning of eighteen nineties, yeah. yeah. Rather, theft and financial schemes gone wrong caused his arrest in Boston on November seventeenth, eighteen ninety four. After decades of criminal activity, the scale and complexity of which you really need a book to fully grasp. H.H. H. Holmes was behind bars. While in jail, connections between him and at least one murder were revealed and a pile of financial charges were obscured by the more sinister accusations. Though he boasted of committing at least 27 murders, he gave three different confessions while imprisoned, all with contradicting numbers. Maybe he doesn't remember how many people he killed. I know, right? It's possible. And sad. It is. The true amount of victims was impossible to corroborate because the mansion was specially equipped for homes to disintegrate leftover body parts in acid baths or to burn them in a human-sized stove. In one pile of ashes, investigators found a small gold chain from a woman's shoe. Wow. That's why I'm like, why would they well, find bones if he had a... Yeah. A stove or acid that acid just disintegrates bones yeah. and everything. It's I was like gonna say that's like the best way nothing. to eliminate remains. 
to avoid like you know being investigated remember giving no ideas do you remember the crime i told you about that happened in china where they like brutally um abused this woman because she stole like ten like she stole this guy's wallet yeah, yeah, then yeah. she returned the wallet to him and he one. said that wasn't enough that she yes. like owed him her life or something yes. like that to be like their slave and then he kidnapped her and kept her in the apartment and yep. all the guys did all these like horrid things to her yes. and the abuse was so bad they couldn't tell if she died like from the like just injuries or just like she couldn't take it or if it yeah. was an actual like hit or something that actually caused her final death yes. and because I of that, that it like got them off from serving a proper sentence and i'm I just know. like what i know it was a, a group of people yeah, yeah and if i'm not mistaken that. those guys are either about to be released or should have already been released after they served like the most minimal sentence one would ever it expect shouldn't matter for something what like she that. died of. i know i was like that is the most bullshit thing i've ever heard like really you can't determine the her. ultimate cause of death they what does her. it matter it, it was doesn't still matter caused by them. They, she still died because of that abuse it shouldn't Anyways, matter what yeah, it's making me think it's this is making me think about that a little bit because it's like, well, you know, we have like the burned remains and everything and all this other evidence that kind of shows what happened. But because we don't have a body to autopsy, know. you know, we have to we can't get somebody on something we can't prove. It's like, I mean, but everything the proof is in the pudding. Uh, If he burnt them in the stove or put acid on them, he killed them. It's still murder. What does it matter in the manner of which you murdered them? Exactly. Murder is murder. I was born with the devil in me, Holmes would later explain. I could not help the fact that I was a murderer. No more than the poet can help the inspiration to sing. What a disgusting really? man. What a pathetic excuse. As recounted in Eric Larson's book, The Devil in the White City, H.H. H. Holmes began his two-year-long murder spree at a moment in history where an unprecedented throng of unknown, unaccompanied strangers were flooding the streets of Chicago looking for temporary housing. The 1893 Chicago World's Fair was one of American history's most attended cultural events with millions of people attending over a duration of the fair. Noting the thousands of people who went missing during the World's Fair, some papers suggested the actual count of Holmes victims stretched into the 200s, which wouldn't mm. be too hard to believe. That is insane. I know they kind of they like talk about him and like the schemes and everything that he did, which obviously were very elaborate and required great intelligence. Mm -hmm. And so it just is like another thing to show how clear it was that he was so good at, you know, reading his environment and stuff and yep. just finding the perfect scenarios to commit his yeah. crimes. It's crazy. Years of dedication. I know. Right. For the most part, Holmes represented himself at his trial, displaying his classic grace and a remarkable familiarity with the law, according to one paper of the time. See, again, it like shows that he you know, knew what he was doing. Of course. I mean, obviously he didn't because he, he ended up you know, ultimately being in jail. <laughs> so, you know, at the end of the day, he got caught. But still, it's crazy. And the I just watched the Adams Family movie with Alvey like not that long ago. So I'm thinking in my head when he goes, you know, they say only a fool represents himself in court. And by God is my witness, I am that fool. <laughs> <laughs> he was that fool. <laughs> so H.H. H. Holmes, you are that fool. <laughs> mm -hmm. His charm wasn't enough for the jurors, though, and he was unanimously sentenced to hanging. Very familiar with what could be done to a body after death, Holmes requested that his be encased in cement within his coffin. No, oh, you don't have the right to right? ask for You shouldn't be able to ask for anything. Exactly. Before his death in 1896, H.H. H. Holmes had suggested that he was turning into the devil. Even his face, he said, was taking on a demonic look. Indeed, when the floor was dropped beneath him, his neck didn't snap like it was supposed to. He lay twitching for 20 minutes before being pronounced dead. Later, strange fates befell the people connected to the case. The man who had initially tipped off the police to H.H. H. Holmes' illegal dealings was shot by a Chicago police officer. The warden at the prison where Holmes had been held killed himself. The office of the district attorney who argued the famous case caught on fire. The only item to survive the blaze intact was a photo of Holmes. Oh my gosh. Maybe he really that was. That is creepy. Maybe he really did have the devil in him. Maybe hmm. he really was doing some black, you know, I satanic stuff. Knows. 
Well, all of this sounds like it, it, all of this does sound like perhaps he was involved in some satanic like rituals. And it sounds like he, in his moments of death, which is why he didn't die normally, was doing like some sort of uh, hex type deal I mean, on everyone involved. <clears throat> It could, it could be. I mean, I read somewhere that he, the first victim that he killed was a cousin of his. I think he was uh, eight years old or something like that. He was mm -hmm. like eight years old. Yeah, a when kid. he killed. Um, I think it was maybe his these cousin. were sacrifices. And um, after that, he just he just always had the urge of killing people. And then he thought, what was the best thing or the best way? That he can murder people. Medical school. Right. And that's what. That's what. Ambitioned him. To take medical school. So that he can learn. How to operate on people. How to torture people. And keep them alive. And that's where he learned. All his techniques. Yeah. In medical school. Yep. He's what? not the first. <laughs> I mean. It's like usually. People take go to medical school to help save lives, to make a difference in the community. To some people don't to make a difference, you know. And here we are with that little small percentage that just go to medical school to learn how to torture people, kill people, amputate them, yeah, tear crazy. them apart, <laughs> sell their their crazy. their parts to the black market. Yep, insane. And final note here, Patrick Quinlan, former caretaker of the castle who, after Holmes, knew the most about the haunted building, commits suicide in 1914. He left a one-sentence note that stated, I could not sleep. So even after death, he tortured these poor people. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. That's why I'm like, maybe he did do something like satanic or whatever. Or it's possible that with all these deaths that he was committing could have also been ritualistic. He could have been like sacrificing humans as part of his thing. You know, it's very common that people do will like do stuff like that to get certain things or, you know, like maybe he was doing it as a means of at achieving his wealth. I don't know. I don't know. That um mansion, hotel, murder, home, whatever you want to call it, torture murder chamber, mansion. murder murder mansion, it's still there today. Yeah. And you can actually tour it. Would you ever visit this murder? It's still very haunted. No, I wouldn't. You would not it's, step foot in there. Too, you know how empath it, we are. It gives like, me um dark yeah. vibes this, like that hell house yes there was this one guy who went in there one time and he saw so many things he didn't want to go back in there but then when they did the interview because there's also on youtube you can watch the interview um they went into the house and he was like i promised myself i would never come back here but i'm back here, here i am he's like i'm back here for you guys so <laughs> let's do this and he was in the basement Oh, that's where all the and terrible things like, yeah, happen. Right? That's where the worst things happen was in yeah. the basement. Like, um, that's the where, unlucky people went to the basement. That's where he was conducting his quote unquote surgical yeah. procedures or moving organs and stuff and something on the black market, which mind you, they must have been alive or recently dead in order to be able to get the organs that are still like, you know, no, fresh I enough the to be sold. the unlucky ones went to the basement because that's who he tortured. The um, ones on the he did second the surgical floor procedures. were the lucky ones because that's where he did the procedures to remove their... It said he did surgical procedures down there. They found that's where he had the furnace, the thing to burn the bodies. Also, they had, he had his surgical area. So the lucky ones went to the basement. The unlucky one. Everybody no. was unlucky in this case. I mean, I mean every, of course, everybody was unlucky, but they didn't get tortured. He just everything. He happened put in them the to sleep and then performed surgery and then got rid of the body. Everything it happened was, in the basement. It was the other people. Oh, this was on the basement that he said, didn't um, use their body parts. He tortured them until they died. That was all in the basement. He, he had, had the second he floor had and then like, he had the basement. He said the base. They said the basement is where what hid all of the stuff he was doing mm -hmm. and so like he had his area where he like cremated them he had his area where he commit where he um did the surgery and then there was another section down there that had like torture tools and stuff like that so it was all in the basement that was like his workspace 
And then another thing, when that fair came, he knew that that was going to bring so many people. And he was yeah. like so ready for it. He was like so excited and ready for well, it. Well, one, he knew about the fair. He knew that like um, that it was booming in Chicago. There were a yeah. lot of people coming in and everything. And he knew that a lot of people were looking for apartments. That's why he created that place. Yeah. That's why he chose Chicago. Yeah. That's why I said, you know, like when he kept like with all his different aliases and all the crap he was doing and everything. And then ultimately the what he did in Chicago, the murder mansion, that's what ultimately got him caught and put in prison. Yeah. It's like, where can I go? There's going to be a lot of people where they're going to disappear and no one's going to ask any questions. Yeah, like, Chicago. Mm, Chicago. It's a booming place. Chicago. People Chicago. come and go. People come and go, and there's not going to be any questions yeah. of what what I do. The Windy City. I'm just glad that they, whoever put his sketch of his torture chambers together with the bones, I'm so glad they did that because he would have probably still continued to keep killing. Well, the thing is, he didn't even initially get arrested for the murders. He was arrested for committing for other types of fraud. Yeah. yeah, for other types of money fraud. That's what ultimately put him in prison. And then, because of that, they started searching through his place. And then they found the connection with the murders. And then they pegged him for all that. Which he confessed over multiple times and kept changing the number of people that he killed. Insane. And the number that we ultimately end up with here in the story is the number 27. So I don't know if 27 was like the middle point of whatever numbers he was giving out. He said 27, but, but there was like I'm sure there was a over lot 200. more. Yeah, they, they speculate that over 200. Nobody knows for sure. But it is implied that this place is incredibly haunted. Yeah, I mean, why is. wouldn't it be? It could be haunted for multiple things. It's probably One, haunted with him. I it's know. It's haunted with so many him things. Him and his dark energy and the souls of people who were murdered. Who knows? There was a show, and I don't know. I have to look it up. It was a new show. They showed it last year. It's called in The In-Between. And I love that show. And I don't know if it was canceled or not, but I got to check. Anyway... There was once one episode in there that was actually with him. And he I mean, it was him, but he was like raping little girls and then he was killing them and he was stealing their parts. And he was like they had him on the show. It, he was H.H. H. Holmes, a doctor that was a serial killer. And it was a spirit. It was his spirit and he was like taking over people and turning them into doctors, making them want to take doctor careers. And then he was like possessing them and then he was killing them. He was raping the girls and he was killing them hmm. in the show. And then I thought that it was just the character they invented. I didn't know. No, it was based off of him. There's another story about a guy who also was like in the medical field. And he was, uh, I don't know if he was, an, I think he was a nurse. And he went around, he initially had like served in the military and then ended up being, um, I don't know if he was like discharged from the military or whatever, like injured or something. And then he became a nurse and then he was using that as a way to just kill people in the hospitals. So he would just like administer like lethal doses of medication Another and stuff like that. Yep. And killing people. And the thing is, this guy killed so many people. And the hospitals were, like, not doing anything about it. Like, they knew that there was suspicious stuff going on and stuff. And they just kept uh, firing him. But then saying that, like, if he would go to another hospital, they would give him a positive thing what? to be hired again at another hospital. It didn't make any sense. And then there was, like, they said that, you know, this is, like, one of the reasons why they you know why? have a lot of big stuff on, like, hospitals having <laughs> to report things and, you know, like, people dying and everything. And now it's, like, a whole big deal and a whole system in place to prevent stuff like this from happening again. Yeah. But it's crazy to think that, like, at that time, I think it was, like, in the 19, early 1900s, he was going around doing this and just, like, killing yeah. people. And the hospitals were firing him, like suspiciously knowing that like he had to do with it but also telling the other places when he would be doing interviews at another hospital then they'd be like oh yeah he's fine he's great go ahead and hire because him. they didn't want a bad reputation in their hospital that's number one 
So, yeah. yeah, we got rid of him, but we don't want a reputation and we don't want to raise yeah. flags on he could have killed all these people. Because Even though now they our knew hospital, that he did it. But it's going to look bad on their hospital. That's crazy. That's That was a lot yeah, of things back then. Like, Image was everything back then. Yeah, he went from the hospital to like nursing home. He went to various hospitals, killed like tons of people. They hid a lot of things back then just because of Image. He was up there too in like the amount of people that he killed. Wow. Like Florence Nightingale. <laughs> she was yeah. the, the night and angel. And the other doctor who also would kill his patients. There's a lot of cases. Angel um, of death. Where they would do that. Like this one doctor, he got caught because his last victim was an older woman and she had, I think it was like her, her kids, like her daughter or something like that. She was fine. And then all of a sudden he saw her and he administered a lethal dose of something to her and killed her. And then the daughter was like, no, I'm not having it. There's no mm -hmm. way that she just passed away from a heart thing. Because he kept writing it off as, oh, they're just having heart attacks. They're just dying from heart attacks. It's like, really? Like, how many people of your patients are yeah, just going to come and all of a sudden they're just dying from if heart you attacks? Don't, if you as the family don't request uh, thanks to that girl though, an autopsy. Thanks to the daughter, though, they were able to catch that he injected she an something autopsy. in her and caused her death. And that is what stopped him. Good. She so, demanded an autopsy. Shout and out found to it. the daughter from like <coughs> forever ago who did not take heart exactly. attack as a thing and knew that something was her. wrong. Good she was like, her. "How is it that she's fine until all of a sudden you mm -hmm. see her and now she's just dead?" Especially really? if she probably didn't even have a history of heart issues. Well, all his patients had a history, kind of. But he was making them worse. That's the thing. He was like making them worse. He was like he was doing it in a way to make it look like they were just getting worse and yeah. worse and worse. And then he would like administer that final lethal dose and kill mm -hmm. them. Mm -mm. And so, yeah, the daughter was like not having it. She's like, no, that's why it's kind of scary right. to be in a hospital. <laughs> it's scary. I mean, you just never know who's a serial <sighs> killer in there. It's wearing harder a to white get, coat. Yeah, it's harder to get away with it now than it was back then because there was like not so much um investigations that went into yeah. people dying that's why now every time someone dies you know they it's have important to that they look into yeah. everything that happened especially if there's no history yeah and now like, like they don't have like this history on them well now thankfully they take things a lot more seriously mm -hmm. that like even a small thing like yeah. administering the wrong type of medication even though it's not deadly they take that stuff like really seriously mm -hmm. and you can lose um your ability to continue like working in a hospital or a nursing home mm -hmm. and stuff like that so it's a lot different now. And then they were like explaining how like the systems in the hospital and like all the stuff they have to do and how everything needs to be like maintained yep. and reported and everything. And so there's a lot more stuff in place now to protect you. Then, but yeah, back then now, it was just like, oh, well, they just died. It because was, it was now just, it is what it is. You have a license and if you're fired based on and you can't practice they, they again. Can, they can actually, they can fire you. They might not be able to prove anything, but they can let you go and they can send that into the board. And then it goes into your license. So then if somebody goes to try or you try to get another job, that's there. Yeah, it's just going to say like, nope, can't practice anymore. They just take it away. It's like, eh, red flag. Yeah, it's harder now. That's why <laughs> That's why nobody wants to get like malpractice, right? Mm -hmm. and it's a serious thing. Yep, it is. Yeah. It is a serious thing so. because if you are negligent on malpractice, you, you have to go in front of the board. Yeah. Here's the thing, though. This guy was not even a doctor. He literally just had a building, had knowledge from wow. like how to do it. And then that's how he, this guy, H.H. H. Holmes, that's, that's how, how he was murdering his victims. Then. It's crazy. I mean, I'm glad now you have to have, now there's that um, website that anybody who has a license in the medical backgrounds, you can actually go in there and see their license. Yeah, you can look if, all that stuff up. <clears throat> like back then you couldn't do that. You had to send a mm -hmm. letter out to that place and then wait for the response. And so you were able to like, <clears throat> create fake documents and yeah it's insane for me the part that killed me with the nurse who was going around and working in these hospitals and killing mm -hmm. people the part that killed me the most is the fact that they fired him under this like the suspicion that he was causing these deaths and then still every single hospital was letting was saying that he's good to go mm -hmm. leaving like what do they call it leaving him on like a positive status or yeah. something like that like not um they would they were putting it as like just a simple like layoff or something instead of that he instead was terminated of just saying, we terminated him because you know patients all almost all his patients yeah. were just There's, mysteriously 
becoming ill or dying. There's more to the story. I think there was like something about like hospitals weren't protected back then from like if one of their people did malpractice, like the whole hospital had to pay for that. And so they didn't want to have to pay for that. So they were just like letting it go under the rug and just letting him go. That's how. But they couldn't fire him for that because then they would have to report it, and then you know they'd end up probably paying like a whole bunch of fines and and all this. They're the ones that get sued, and they walk away with just being fired. And then the hospital is responsible so, for these patients. Yeah, I think that's why now when you you can like go do my practice and everybody has yes. to have like their own insurance and yes. it's not necessarily under the hospital. Like for the hospital, they would have to be found, you know, like exactly. negligent under other terms. Like the but, hospital will have to be found that they intentionally hired that person knowing that that person is not capable of doing that job. Yeah. Then they're responsible. I could be... A little off or, on how I explain that, but it's something if very they've similar. done things in the past that they kept hidden, yeah, then the hospital is reliable. Yeah, but now as long as they like report everything and you know the investigations are done, they don't have to you know like worry about it falling on the it falls on That's the person why when something committing. Happens, if a patient dies yeah. on an operating table, it's a big, this, there's yeah. like this big old class where there's a whole bunch of doctors that know you that are there that you've worked with or worked under. And then they all have to say something about you. And then the people that were in the surgery has to be there. And each one has to write out a report of their well, of what happened isn't there. It's almost like a little trial. There is. Um, and it's and then the isn't doctor, there somebody that like is suppo- is writing down everything that's happening in the surgery, like in the table or something like somebody documents all the problems. And then I think they like, there's a lot of documentation that happens during the procedure. I know there's recordings and stuff. And then each there's person some, has to do their own report. There's like, I remember cause I saw it in that little docu series they did on Gabriel Fernandez. Mm-hmm. And when <clears throat> he went in, there was a woman, I forgot what her job title was, but she had to like be notating everything down so when he came in and everything, it was like she had to like write all his injuries and everything. And then I think she was writing like while they were doing certain stuff to him and like finding injuries and everything like that. And she had to like document everything that was going on. Um, Cause when they do like the medical report at the end, it pretty much says like everything yes. that happened in the procedure. Yeah. Like it all gets documented. But when someone dies on the operating table, each oh, of I those, don't know how each that person stuff works, has to do their own report. Of yeah, the um, steps that they took, the steps they did, and what they observed. I don't know anything about that, but then the doctor has to stand in front and explain in detail because that that's all recorded and explain in detail the steps that they did when they were doing the surgery and how and what happened that it led to that death. I have no idea so, if that's what they do, but yeah. I so that know. if it was a mistake, it would not happen again. I don't have any knowledge. Or could it have been something that could have been prevented? Like they, it's like a little mini trial that they do in case there's a malpractice suit. Yeah, I don't have any knowledge on that, but um, it's it would be crazy to for your job to be a surgeon, like operating on people, mm-hmm. to have people's lives in your hands and like know that everything that you do is affecting this person's ability to live or die is like insane. <clears throat> <clears throat> it's it crazy is. it's definitely it not something i could do Mm-mm. talk about you think that any job you work is high stress try being a surgeon forget that that's like the most stressful job yeah, you, you can ever do bucks, but and then they'll be in there for hours like working on a patient yeah they could be there for like eight hours mm-hmm. or more it's insane like that job is crazy it is. it's insane yeah god bless the people who are who do surgeries don't know how they do it and either. to remember everything about the human body <laughs> when it all looks the same. I know. You open it up and everything just looks the same to me. I think, oh, this is this and this is that muscle and this is this and this is I this know. artery and this is this vein. I'm like, how can you tell? They all look the same. You know, in the pictures, they make them all nice and everything is color coded and everything's color coordinated. And when you open the body, everything is just blood. <laughs> like, how do you know the difference between all those different, I have you know, no parts of the body? Yeah. But like always, we're off topic. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Because that has nothing to do with Halloween. (laughs) Well, H.H. Holmes. Well, this whole story is like a spooky, creepy, scary story. So it falls under the Halloween genre. 
of content, <laughs> including the fact that he claimed that he had the devil in him mm-hmm. and the place is incredibly haunted. So this still falls under Halloween. Um, ghost, spooky, yeah. scary, creepy, yeah. unsettling, demented. Yeah. <laughs> How many words I can use to describe this story? Yep. This is one of the craziest stories we've done in terms of like, it's very graphic it's very brutal and it's um, so crazy that i actually want to get the book now and read the whole story oh there's a book on him yeah tell me why does hh H. holmes sound like a freaking like a name that's used for someone who writes books i know right, right? <laughs> it sounds like it, it sounds like i would see hh H. holmes like on the name of a mystery book or something right I know. like this mystery book was written by hh H. holmes that's what it sounds like it yeah, doesn't make you think man who murdered people and cut open their bodies and sold their organs on the black market no <laughs> yeah and yet that's what it was so no nope, but they do have a book and i want to read what's that the book, book called the book it's actually in the article oh uh I'm trying to find it here it is as recounted in eric larson's book the devil in the white city that's the one so eric larson is the author book is devil in the white city yep now i gotta read it <laughs> Because you know the book is more in well, detail. Yeah, of course. The book everything will have, that happened. Yeah, of course. It'll talk about how he killed his cousin at the age of eight and mm-hmm. how it all started. Hopefully, that'll have all that in there. <laughs> a good book will fill in every detail yeah. for you as much as is a able good to book be filled is going to tell the history before the crimes. Yeah, um, that reminds me of that new Netflix documentary, American Murder. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was it called? American Murder. Yeah. Chris Watts or whatever. Yeah. The Watts Family Murder. Yes. That uh, was that. Yeah. That was she just, just watched sad. the document series. I watched. Yeah. Well, it's not a docu series. A documentary. She watched the documentary movie on Netflix. Yeah. I watched the documentary movie on Netflix. Also, I read a book that was called "My Daddy Is My Hero." Is the name of the book, and it's about Chris Watts, which is a quote from because what, some, what his called, daughter said. Yes. Yeah. She sang a song to him that was like, "My daddy is my hero. Yes. He makes me strong oh, and healthy." You're just making my hair and stand it, up. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I read the book, which was actually interesting because it was like a psycho analysis, mm-hmm. basically trying to understand the psychological aspects that led to him like doing the murder and stuff like that. Actually, it's kind of useful because at the same time, it also teaches you like signs to look out for as well, because there oh, are, I don't, I don't there need are, to like, read a book to tell me signs. Well, not you, but maybe <laughs> other people, some yes, red flags. Some people do need to, to learn these yeah. red flags. It like helps you kind of pinpoint some like red flags to look out for in a because in the a more, person or like in a relationship. Yeah, because for me, the more you know, the safer you'll be, and the less victims these people will have. Yeah, that's true. Unfortunately, put them in an island, right? <laughs> let them well, manipulate there was each one other. Called Alcatraz. Yeah, let them Remember manipulate that? each other. Wait, is Alcatraz still a used prison today? No, I don't think it is. Right, no. but you can tour Alcatraz. Isn't Alcatraz like extra yes. haunted too? Yes. Have you ever been to Alcatraz? No. Would you ever go to Alcatraz? No. Why not? Because um, a lot of people that went there and were tur- tortured and killed, a lot of people were innocent or they didn't belong there. Mm. Some people did. And I feel like those are the stronger spirits that are probably there, the evil ones who probably deserved everything. You don't want to go got. to Alcatraz and do a ghost spirit box? No, <laughs> because they probably deserved what they got. <laughs> But there were oh, a lot of innocent people that went there that shouldn't have gone there to serve sentences. Because hmm. back then, you know, a lot of prisons held innocent people. Hey, there's and still people today. today. I today, know I was going to say that hasn't was, changed. You know, prison always held more people innocent today. people than people that really deserve to be there. Because it's the manipulators that got away. Yeah. Those are the ones that get away with everything. Yeah, unprecedented <laughs> they know how to conversation manipulate. about the mass amounts of people mm-hmm. that are in prison that shouldn't even be there because prison is a business. Well, there's a saying, um, prisoners are for innocent. There's a saying. You mean prisons are for the innocent? Yeah. Prisons were built for the innocent. Prisons were built for the accused, whether you're innocent or not. Yeah. I think that's how it goes. <laughs> I mean, they say, um, you know, in America, you're not guilty. I know. I was going to say, you know, in you're America, not guilty until you're innocent until proven guilty. Really? But, because but you're in our sitting system, in jail, exactly suffering until you're proven. So how innocent. is that innocent <laughs> until proven guilty would mean you're yeah. not you can't arrest that person until they exactly. have the day in court. They should have a freedom then until the day in court. 
when they're found guilty, then you put them behind bars. That is an innocent until proven guilty but system. Some people this is a guilty, need to be in prison as soon as they're I know. taken. This is a guilty until proven innocent method exactly. that we currently have but that's what i thing, hate that statement but that's a but like that's for big crimes like murder and stuff like that like that murder statement. i can understand putting you away right exactly. away we had to find you innocent first because you're too high risk but for like the stupid like petty dumb crimes and they want to put you in prison until like you weed so that they like can that. just stupid. put you out on like what do you call that? So to have you sit in prison for I like know. 10 days so that they could tell you, you oh, know what? It's fine. You just pay a fine or, oh, just go do some community service exactly. or whatever. It's like, really, really, mm -hmm. really, really. I say really a lot. I know. But th that that statement should go away. It should just go away. But anyways, yeah, I was like guilty until proven innocent. Because you're guilty until you can prove your yeah, innocence. Yeah, that's how it works here. <laughs> That's how it truly is. And well, that's, that's why it, it shouldn't say right? innocent until proven places. guilty. No, you're guilty until you can prove your innocence. Yeah, nobody believes that. Plain and simple. I think they phrase it that way just to make it sound nicer. But in reality, but we all know not. it's not true because. Like when they say justice is blind, but it's not. So that's a whole other story. Justice is blind. Uh, you know how they say justice is blind and they have the 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 female justice. Statue there's like a million. The, there's a million cases. Her eyes that can, covered and she's holding the two yeah, balances. No. Saying that, you know, justice is blind. There's like and it's ten thousand cases <laughs> that can be brought up in which yeah, no. the circumstances are identical <laughs> and yet different people. Is not blind. Yeah. There are like a million different cases of things that have the exact same circumstances with people who faced completely different sentences. But so then that's a whole there's other, no such thing. That's a whole other chat. <laughs> justice is the opposite of blind justice is fed by money many other things money greed i think at the end of the day we just say there really is no such thing as justice in the yeah. criminal justice system <laughs> well, that made me feel like i was about to say the criminal justice system is represented by two yet equally important sides or whatever <laughs> what do they call that the yeah. the prosecutors and the district attorney and the the district attorneys and the prosecutors who okay, do whatever. Okay, you start anyways, to sound like that show. CSI. No. No, Law and Order. Law and Order. <laughs> I don't know my shows, man. <laughs> it's because we talk about conspiracies too much. So, then, so you know, you talk. we can talk about any story, and I guarantee you we'll find a conspiracy well, it, that's attached a conspiracy. to it, right? <laughs> we'll end it with we'll it being a conspiracy. It to a conspiracy somehow. H.H. <laughs> H. Holmes is a conspiracy. You can say a topic like, Bloom, where you are planted. Him. That's a conspiracy. <laughs> well, I did like that. That's a conspiracy because what about the places that you can't <laughs> bloom in because there's no sun, huh? And you're set up to fail. It's just a conspiracy. Because you're, or you're planted in the desert. We are set Guess what? to fail. The person planted in the desert is not going to bloom like the person who is planted in the nice, uh, you know, open field that gets rain. Anyway, getting back to Halloween. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, so you said, I can't talk. You sent me a text message yes, that I said did. that there's a drive through haunt Yes, there here. is in Kissimmee. So check in your local area, wherever you are. We're in Central Florida. So we saw the one that's like in Orlando or Kissimmee or something like that. That one is in Where Kissimmee. Is um, Groupon actually has uh, coupons. It's a drive through haunted, haunted house. It's called drive through Halloween Haunt. Yeah, are we gonna do that? I don't know. I was thinking about it, but it sounds more kid friendly. You think? Anyway, it's um, on Groupon. The address is 2001 East Southport Road in Kissimmee. So it's so a. If you wanna check it out? Um, it's depends on the time that you go, but if you go in the evening one, which is like 9.30 to 11 p.m. or something like that, it's like $49. Yeah. And it's for a car with a maximum, I think, of eight people in a car. Wait, and then, you're telling me I can't drive in my car with 12 people in there? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to count them out. Like, I know, uh, right? Uh, it's as over, many people we're going to have to change the price. <laughs> as many people as fit in the seatbelts. And then if you go earlier, it's like $45. Well, it's on. It's oh, a Groupon deal because the normal price is $74 or $69. So it's all depending. But it's something that you can do. Yeah, so you want you a pandemic to get out the friendly. Car. They're also going to give treats. So, oh, cool. Yeah, that's why I think it's more kid friendly, yeah. maybe. Uh, probably something that a it kid is would go a through. pandemic friendly haunted attraction that yeah. you can go through. You don't have to get out of your car. You don't got to be, yeah. you know, at least I don't think you got to get out of your car. 
Well, the point is you drive through. So you're not like, you know, face to face interacting with people. You get to be in solitary yes. confinement in your car. <coughs> I don't know why I use the term solitary confinement. <laughs> I don't know. But you can be in your car driving through, seeing some cool stuff that they have set up, you know. Oh, also Universal has two haunted houses. So if you buy a day ticket and you go to the parks, which apparently I think are operating at full capacity again, yes. they have two haunted houses that if you visit during the day, you can go and view those two haunted houses mm -hmm. during your stay. And I think it's in, you know, in, in the Universal Studios side. So my question is, is anyone going out trick or treating? Let me know. Oh, yeah. I want to know, do I buy candies or not? You know, I want to know who's trick-or-treating. And then another thing, if you can't go out trick-or-treating or you choose not to go out trick-or-treating or you don't want to do a drive thing, then have a movie night. It's possible that people might still do trick-or-treating and everybody will just wear face masks when buy they're out and about. Buy a whole bunch of candy, popcorn and yeah. everything and just sit and do haunted here's, cartoons or Here's movies. a pandemic-friendly option. You purchase candy and then as you handle the candy and everything, you use gloves, gloves. and stuff in mm -hmm. a sanitized, clean area. You make little baggies mm -hmm. and you put them on the table and then... And, just the, let them and come you up make and sure the table is wiped down and they just grab the bags. Yep. You know, and as they leave, you it's wipe sanitized, down and put friendly. More bags. Yeah. And when you have to restock the table, you re you clean it again yep. and stock it with more bags. That could be like a still or a just pandemic make sure friendly that option. If you answer the door, you're wearing your mask um, and you're handling everything with gloves. So that, you know, they can see that it's safe to grab and put the candies all in a bag. You know, like when you go yeah. to open that bag, make sure you're wearing gloves. Don't touch the candy with your bags. Wear a mask when you're handling it as well. So you're opening these bags. You're making little goodie bags. Keep them closed, sealed to keep them protected so mm -hmm. that they know that, you know, they can feel safe grabbing that bag. I was going to say trick or treat with um, confidence. Yes. <laughs> I feel like it's a commercial trick or treat with confidence. Yes. I never thought that we would be in a position where we would be worrying about things like that. You know, it's crazy. Yep, I know. But we're here. So. I say that every time we talk about stuff like this. Like, oh, here's some precautions to take. And then at the end, I'm like, uh, it's kind of crazy that we even have to, you know. I mean, I hope think about that, or that we talk get about trick or treaters that. because Halloween is my favorite season. It's my, it's my Mine favorite. Too. I know it's not a holiday, but it's my favorite holiday. They need to make it a holiday. They should have day off. Halloween. <laughs> I know, right? But it's it's my favorite because I love, love, love seeing the kids in their in costumes, costumes seeing when their original costumes how creative they are when they put things together how you know how creative they are and how they enjoy going out and saying chicka tree chicka tree you know and they just like showing off their costume walking around the neighborhood you know it i love that i loved it yeah. when you guys were little and i took you guys trick-or-treating Although I do have a funny on her. Yeah. <laughs> Took oh her trick-or-treating one time. And we went up to the house because the light was on. She's like, oh, the light is on. So we go up to the house. The lady is is like, oh, they, she was like, trick-or-treat. And the lady was like, oh, I'm so sorry. We don't have any candy. My husband just went out to go buy some more candy. And she's like, but I said trick-or-treat. And the lady was like, oh, my God, you're so right. She emptied out her purse trying to find something in her purse to give her and she ended up giving her like money and stuff mm. i was like oh my gosh sam really <laughs> she's I like but i said chick a tree yeah the things i did as a kid <laughs> i was crazy yeah. i was wild <laughs> I was a kid who, like, if you would have recorded everything I did as a oh kid, my I'd probably goodness. be, like, viral on freaking YouTube because the yes. stuff that came out of my mouth, I don't even know. Yes. yes I was so yes, crazy. Yes, yes. You weren't crazy. You were That's just... Good. I'll just... Uh, well, I'll very, film some very, videos pretending to be a kid and we'll just reenact everything I did. She was All the very ridiculous verbal. things I did as a kid. She was verbal. Straightforward. Yeah. Well, next and time, never turn off your anything. light when you're out of candy. <laughs> Everybody knows the light. Yes, <laughs> she's like, well, the light is on and I said trick or treat. So, <laughs> like, oh, where's my candy? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Nobody's obligated to give you candy. <laughs> the epitome of kids say the darnest things. That was her. But yeah. So that concludes today's podcast. Um, let us know what you think about this story. Um, 
we went off on multiple tangents, but at the end of the day, we were talking about the H.H. H. Holmes uh, murder mansion slash murder hotel house. And so in Chicago. Yeah. And are you trick-or-treating? If you have kids, are you going to be taking your kids trick-or-treating? Um, are you planning on giving out candy? Or are you like, with everything going on, maybe not. Either let way. Let us know. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. want to know. Yeah. Either way, let us know what you're doing. And as always, we hope that you're staying safe, happy, healthy, and manifesting everything you desire out of life. Amen. <laughs>